So Rick Maltese is my name, and I, I've been running the Energy Reality Project for a while. And uh, that name was inspired out of trying to make a comment about the cl Climate Reality Project. Em energy Reality, to me, is a better way of seeing the problems that we're facing. Climate Reality, sure, but that's not all there is to it. And, and Al Gore ended up being anti-nuclear. So, so he does, I don't think he sees the whole picture. So my Energy Reality book, Energy Reality, The Necessary Renaissance. The Renaissance has been talked about happening sometime in the near future, but it's always been like that for quite a while now. So this is, I'm hoping, the real future. <laughs> I put a quote by Buckminster Fuller. None of the world's problems will have a solution until the world's individuals become thoroughly self-educated. And I think of myself as a good example. I don't have a science background. I have a music background. And um, I, um, I'm um, trained, I'm a professional musician. I did get a degree in computer science, but still, it wouldn't prepare you for nuclear energy and nuclear physics. But uh, you don't need that, and that's my point, and that's also um, even more important to realize is that all those people out in the streets protesting with Greta Thunberg um, are not nuclear scientists. They're not going to go to school to realize how important nuclear energy is. So why would anybody write a book about nuclear energy? The time is right, in my opinion. The hype around the climate strike has clearly expressed the need for action in a time with a few good answers. We live in uh, difficult times. We have a, a world full of diverse individuals with a growing need, and, and they have an opportunity to have their voices heard. But trying to get an audience among all of the chatter is not easy. It requires an opportunistic mindset. It requires pulling out all the stops dealing with the variety of opinions, fears, and opposing forces requires that we be more than just opportunists. We need to change the way we think. And that's largely what inspired me to write the book, to see the challenges we face convincing people how important it is. If there is one way in which my book differs from other books on nuclear energy, it is that it addresses the need for a transformation of the ordinary person. The truth is, we're all extraordinary, but most of us don't think so. So this book targets everybody, but particularly young people. Those same young people, as Greta Thunberg points out, are going to inherit a dim future. The book is intended to reach those and others in a way that indoctrinates them into thinking about solutions and their role in getting those solutions off the ground. Now, the reason I put this up, because I'm a musician, but this is the book of the 48 Preludes and Fugues. And that's my first section of the book is called the Prelude. Instead of calling it a forward, I call it a prelude. So the prelude is my introduction. It's also a musical term in an attempt to show a lineage when the arts were also called the sciences. The purpose of a prelude for music is that it is traditionally prepares the listener for what's to follow. In this book, it shows how important the topic is and that it needs preparation to fully grasp the seriousness of the topic. In a way, this whole book itself is a prelude to your future of understanding energy. A glimpse into a unique and fascinating reality we take too much for granted. As someone residing in Toronto in a cold weather climate, I know there is a risk to going fully 100% renewable, as they say. The shift away from always available hydro and always available nuclear energy puts us at risk who do not have the traditional wood stove, as the picture depicts, that existed over 100 years ago. We all had that at some time, but we all became relied upon energy being there whenever we needed it. I put a title in the next section I call, Can You Handle the Truth? It's about recognizing the degree 
to which our problems have amounted to. Uh, also, I try to put in perspective the so-called dangers that nuclear energy is supposed to have. I mentioned the Green New Deal, and I mentioned the lack of vision and scientific inquiry. On chapter one, I talk about our place in environmental activism. I have spent a considerable amount of time thinking through the sociological reasons that contribute to apathy and uh, disbelief. Chapter two is about energy reality, our group. Um, right now we have a following over 1,200 people on our Facebook group and a lot of prominent members, including several here. And, um, uh, and there's engineers, scientists, um, and, and other uh, enthusiasts. I try to put this into perspective. Um, I mentioned Al Gore. Apparently he has a very expensive home that uses 21 times more energy than the average household. He has a, the boldness to call his followers, the people he trains and puts them out into the field, uh, climate leaders. And I think that's calling them climate leaders is kind of a misleading term. It's a poor choice of words, words to describe a trainee. Also, I try to put into the, this into perspective by uh, devoting time to making a difference. Anyone that makes it can make a difference is essential and each individual matters, no matter how undemocratic things get, we need to act as if our opinion makes a difference, which in some ways can go work against us. <laughs> That's a shooting star. Here I discuss the miracle that Earth even exists, uh, that we have life on Earth. I talk about the natural mechanisms that protect our planet, which seems to be de designed to intentionally protect life. The atmosphere, for example, stops falling objects and shooting stars from reaching the surface and endangering life. And this is just debris we have that could easily become shooting stars in our eyes, but they uh, manage to not uh, hit us or endanger us because they burn up first. I also talk about the fact that we have a magnetic field that uses nuclear decay heat to continually circulate and maintain a magnetic field deep in the Earth's core. And if you're trying to convince somebody that nuclear energy or nuclear is good, nuclear science is good, uh, without that magnetic field, we would not exist or our uh, atmosphere would have been radiated away long ago. So that solar radiation that goes by our planet is deflected by our magnetic field. And um, I, uh, actually, Mars had a atmosphere at one time. They lost their magnetic field. They lost their atmosphere. So I'm, I try to point out that the Earth is, could be fragile. We're not exactly knocking off our magnetic field, but we should think of it as a fragile planet. I get a little more um, uh, holistic in my thinking at uh, a few points, thinking to the the way we need to move forward is thinking holistically. I bring up the idea of the Eco-Modernist Manifesto about leaving nature alone and migrating towards cities. I take on each of the elements, earth, air, and water, and fire. And when I discuss air, I talk about London's smog of 1953 that caused so many deaths because of the burning of too much coal and how so many were killed. I get into the pollutants that exist in in the coal and the, in the ash and the particles like arsenic, mercury, carbon dioxide, of course, carbon monoxide, sulfur. And um, uh, to explain um, about fire, fire is the next element. When I discuss fire, it's hard not to also mention the new fire. I did have a slide on the new fire. Oh, well. Um, so the new fire is a movie, that's the title of a film. When we introduced fire and when we introduced nuclear energy, they were major turning points both times in, in our history. I show this because uh, uh, under uh, an uncompromising reality, uh, there was a number of challenges. Uh, we kept getting reminded by numerous events such as um, mostly weather related, and I discussed the obstacles that prevented nuclear energy from taking off. I also discussed the veil of secrecy that went along. So this is a picture of um, uh, here, the Las Vegas nuclear tour 
So that it became a, they called it nuclear tourism. And there's just a few shots of people just watching an explosion and not being concerned for their safety. And there's a silly one with a little cloud in the background. This one is sort of represents the era of the loss of innocence, where you can see at least two or three, one's a murderer, two are assassinated, and, um, and some other characters. And that shows what the era was like. Here, these are central figures to, um, to very important is at least four of them were pro-nuclear. Cervante Arrhenius from 1896. Everyone knows Alvin Weinberg. He, he said it a few times in the 60s and 70s. Um, we have Edward Teller, who said it in 1959. We have James Hansen, who said it in 1988, warned us of, new, of uh, climate change. But they're all pro-nuclear. And James Lovelock from the 60s talked about Gaia. I also mentioned how politicians rarely promise what's needed. And uh, Obama, who went to Alaska and dramatically presenting the melting of the glaciers, but failing to grasp the steps needed. And the truth is not stated that these kinds of problems are greater than the short-term election cycles. So people like Andrew Yang have thought about um, the unfair election process and presented a, a certificate for maximum investor uh, for, for elections would be $100. I also remind people about how spoiled we are in North America about energy abundance. I have a chapter on um, uh, things like all the things that nuclear have helped us with. Uh, there's another chapter of a guest author. Um, his name is Alan Walthar, Walter. And um, so that is uh, just specifically about the advancements with nuclear technology and how they help us in our life. I also talk about the stewards, and we have a few here, like David LeBlanc and Ed File, and uh, people like that who um, have helped um, point out the value of molten salt reactors. And then finally, I, I, the reason I have, this is Winston Churchill. The quote says, if we fail, then the whole world, including the United States, including all that we have known and cared for, will sink into the abyss of a new dark age made more sinister and perhaps more protracted by the light of perverted science. Let us therefore brace ourselves to our duties and so bear ourselves that if the British Empire and its commonwealth lasts for 1,000 years, men will say, this was their finest hour. So what are we missing? Well, this is, this is um, kind of saying the sinister aspect is hidden in the political agendas. Consequently, a similar kind of challenge exists for us. I hope to show that the path to remedi remediate a sick system is not so unattainable. We humans as a collective need to prevent our existence from evolving into an irreversible path. As individuals, we need to change the way we think. If governments or corporations want our support, we can hold them accountable and insist that they contribute. So I am, after more than, ju I'm after more than just hope, I'm after giving some direction as to how to contribute to the cause. Exactly what I hope you will gain after reading the book. Thank you. <coughs>